Go ahead. Father John, uh, and I discussed what a topic should be entitled, and after discussing it, he put it together, uh, the second part, uh, entitled, Taking It Home to Work to School, Practical Considerations for Ourselves and Our Children. Taking it home, that must be an American thing. <laughs> Take it on home. That's what you say at the end of a song, isn't it? Take it on home. <clears throat> but that's good, because we should take it on home. Uh, because really, our, our faith... Uh, if it's just a bunch of ideas, and especially if it's just a bunch of no, <laughs> series of no's, uh, then it's really not the gospel that Christ had brought. Uh, it's not the fullness of truth of God who became incarnate and died and descended into Hades and heralded of death and rose from the dead. I mean, that's just saying, and don't do this and don't do that. It's not enough. We have to take our faith on home to uh, how we live, uh, or, or really, it's just a, a clanging symbol, as, as St. Paul says. Uh, so what can we do, and what, what has happened in Canada um, after uh, things uh, changed, or at least one stage of the change took place ten years ago? Uh, one thing we found, <coughs> as a traditionally minded people found each other, and it started to work together in ways that honestly were never possible in the past. I told you, when I was a kid, people actually cared if you were Roman Catholic or Protestant. I grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly British and Protestant. And there were these Catholic people, and we talked to them. They were quite nice. And they would even share their vegetables with us. <laughs> and they uh, were actually good neighbors. That, that was a big thing. States, how things have changed. Now, people who share common values uh, find uh, a lot of common cause we found in Canada. Even the Sikhs, the Sikhs, someone said to me the other day, the Sikhs really, as Orthodox Christians, the Sikhs really share our values. Now, don't talk to them about the Trinity. <laughs> don't talk to them about the most of the faith, right? I'm not saying we raise the bar very high here. Uh, I'm not saying that we have a whole lot of spiritual things in common with all these people. Um, I am certainly not advocating that we have some sort of religious celebrations together. But when it comes to just living as good neighbors, um, this, uh, these, these changes in our society have actually forced us uh, to get to know people who share our values and who are good neighbors. And especially people who are new to the country, I've become a kid. Anyone of English background, there's a little sort of snobbery against immigration. Because those people are going to change the country. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Rowan Atkinson's comedy routine when he speaks uh, 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 an act to uh, the British Conservative Party convention. And he says, uh, uh, I'm not against immigration. I like curry. <laughs> but now that we have the recipe, <laughs> do they really need to see? <laughs> uh, so uh, that was very much prevalent in Canada, I think, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now I would say smart Christians and smart Orthodox Christians realize that actually our allies are those who are coming from other places, especially country, Islamic countries where Christians are being persecuted. And these people aren't afraid to talk about the truth of Christianity, and they are not afraid to stand up and assert their values. The same with the new Russians. I had a number of hit a, a seminar at our parish some months ago about educational options, how do you deal with the school system as a result of, of these various changes, and uh, how do you maybe pursue the option of homeschooling, which is increasingly popular. We actually have three, uh, that I know of, three circles of uh, people who are new Russians, Russians who've come in the last five or ten years, who are homeschooling their kids. I thought, I'd never, I'd never live to see this day. But they, they initiated themselves. They came to me, though, and said, <coughs> Father, we fought for all of these things in Russia. We struggled so much in Russia under the, under the Soviets. And then we came here, and we thought everything would be fine. And now we have to fight about this, these basic things. 
me. So this, this naturally provides an atmosphere uh, where, as the old saying goes, the enemy of my enemy will quickly become my friend. Right? We find ourselves with common threats and we can work together without any sort of, uh, thanks very much, buddy. without any sort of illusions that this is going to lead to some sort of false unity or, or anything. Just good neighbors that share values. It kind of brings up a certain nostalgia in me, like the old neighborhood where I discovered that these Catholics were actually sweet people and we could be friends. But now we discover these Sikhs are actually sweet people and we can be friends. We don't pretend we have the same faith. Uh, we probably are never going to get them to become part of the Orthodox Church, but we can we can work together on things where we have a common community issue. Um, the second thing uh, is the importance of mastering technology to use uh, to use against those who spread uh, propaganda for the other side. A lot of the folks who are the most active opponents of religious freedom uh, have no other thing going on in their life. They've got lots of time. So they spent lots of time on uh, online uh, making videos, sharing videos, posting things on Facebook, uh, um, Twittering here and Twittering there, every action and every response that they have. Um, I, would, I would suggest that some of that for Orthodox Christians actually is a really bad idea. It's spiritually destructive to get into that kind of constant back and forth that can actually uh, put us in real spiritual jeopardy. But in terms of being able to use technology to speak to other people, to get a message out, uh, to address an issue, and also to uh, uh, speak to others who share our views can be very, very helpful. It can be mutually encouraging. And we can also educate other people uh, this way. We won't convert everyone. In fact, we will very convert very few people, not spiritually convert them, but convert them to the cause as it were. Uh, but um, it will help win some. Uh, smart politicians are already anticipating uh, this issue and will work together with groups who share their values. We're seeing this very much in Canada where uh, traditionally our Conservative Party, which would loosely be, very loosely be like your Republican Party, um, would only get votes from white middle class people when 80% of the country was white and middle class. And the Liberal Party of Canada would draw some of that vote, they're like loose with the Democrats, uh, but they would get basically all of the non-white vote and all of the non-Christian vote. Well, that's flipped now because the Conservative Party in Canada has tried to build bridges uh, to people who actually share the same traditional values. And a lot of these people are new Canadians. So when this issue came up recently of whether women should be able to wear the niqab veil when they go for the Muslim women for the citizenship oath, uh, there were people saying, oh, see, he's going to kill himself with new immigrants. New Canadians are not going to like him making an issue of this. Well, his support went up with them because they bring with them uh, values from abroad that maybe North Americans have lost. And uh, this is actually something that's common ground. Uh, and technology allows uh, us to plug into those things. I would suggest that it also allows us to um, make connections and help other brothers and sisters in Christ um, uh, in the church here in the English-speaking Western world. Uh, there's a priest monk in Australia, a rope or a priest monk, Father Cosmas, um, a higher monk at the monastery of the Archangel Michael there, who does uh, monthly talks, and there are many priests, some here, uh, beautiful uh, CD talks, quite extensive. Uh, uh, topics uh, really uh, applicable to everyday life. And the benefit of uh, technology is really easily seen there because you here you have access to talks and really to a, a personal contact almost with this person who lives on the opposite side of the world who 40 years ago we wouldn't even know existed. And now we can hear his voice. I have the privilege sometimes of talking to him on the phone on my telephone uh, trunk plan so I can ask him uh, uh, questions about things he said in his talk. It, it's very, very helpful because we have access, just as we do uh, have more books today uh, in language, translated into various languages, we also have access uh, to more um, um, explanations of those things. So technology helps with that uh, too. 
Uh, the other good side of this is that Soviet-style statism surrounding uh, issues like marriage uh, is not going to hold because of alternate media. You don't just get the word from three media sources or the official state media that you must believe this and if you don't, everyone's against you. Because there are so many alternative <coughs> media that as long as YouTube's out there and GoFundMe's out there, uh, people are always going to have a dissenting voice. And that's very good when it comes to protecting the, the religious freedoms of Orthodox Christians. Uh, because uh, the, the media facilitates uh, a diverse, diversity of opinion, whether or not uh, the activists, the anti-Christian activists, uh, want that or not. They would love to silence us, but uh, technology doesn't allow that silencing to happen. A third thing, uh, we have to learn, and people are learning slowly, Canadians are very nice, so they're slow to learn this one, <laughs> strategies to defy and avoid tax, attacks on religious freedom. Uh, just like uh, the crypto-Christians of the Ottoman Empire, they developed strategies to anticipate what people were going to say to them, uh, anticipate what people were going to do to them, and uh, they would be able to deflect or avoid those attacks. We have to be very careful uh, in what we say and what we write, and make sure we chronicle what other people say and write too, if we're going to have a public discussion with them. Because then we can confront them honestly, uh, and uh, people can't use lies as easily. There's nothing, there's nothing like um, a bright light to clear out a house full of bugs, right? The, the bugs don't like the bright light, so we shine that bright light, uh, knowing what people are saying and doing, uh, shine that bright light on any, any uh, conversation, and that helps um, a great deal. Um, Sometimes uh, this means becoming as wise as serpents, as the Lord says. We have to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. A friend of mine once compared to another priest in town uh, and I, and he said, you two are so much alike, you're, you're virtually the same. You're virtually the same person. And I said, no, no, we're very different. And he said, no, you're not. How, how could you be different? I said, well, you remember in the Gospel where it's, the Lord says, be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I said, I am the first, he is the second. <laughs> now, he's going to get into heaven faster. Uh, that's the thing. But as Orthodox Christians, we have to relearn, because we've lived in such comfort in North America, we have to relearn the strategy of being wise as serpents. What does that mean? Who is the serpent? The serpent is the evil one, the devil. We have to know the mind of the devil without having it. <laughs> we must not acquire the mind of the devil. We have to acquire the mind of the saints. We have to think and act and breathe and live like the saints, but we also have to know what's going on with the devil and how he works, and how those who are uh, kind of controlled by him, like puppets, not, not voluntarily often, um, how they're operating, so that we can anticipate things people will say or do, and not live in fear. We can have ourselves ready, so that when someone loses their temper or brings up some issue, we can be sort of ready for it, because really it's the same old thing. I had a, a dealt with a number of uh, pastoral cases where um, young people have come to me who experience same-sex attraction. In one case, a young woman came to me, she was a bit challenging, she said, uh, so what do you think of me? And I said, uh, oh, you seem like an intelligent person. She said, no, 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 you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> My lifestyle who I am. I said, oh, oh, yeah, that. I said, oh, um, it's boring. She said, you can't say that. I said, what? She said, well, you're either an ally or you're a hater. I said, no, no, you're, it's boring. She said, how's it boring? I said, oh, well, you know, you guys are always on TV, at a parade. <laughs> you're in every sitcom. It's just another passion. That's how the church fathers talk about it. Why do you get all the attention? It's so boring. <laughs> just treat it like another passion. We all have to struggle against our passions. I have a passion. I'll tell you one of my passions, chocolate. I like pure chocolate a lot. If you give something to me, I will have difficulty resisting eating. This is a problem, fortunately. 
God protect me from diabetes. So far, so good. But you know, it's a real, it's a genuine risk, especially as one who's older and not as thin as one used to be. Um, I said, you know, I don't get a parade. I want a parade. I want big brown flags. I want people dressed up as Hershey's Kisses going down the street, thousands of them, right? Why doesn't my passion get a parade? She was just astounded. She said, what? So, are you, are you an ally? Or are you, do you hate us? I said, no, I just think you're awfully boring. It's the same old passions, everybody has some, you've got that one, why do you get all the attention? Why is it so exciting? If we anticipate how um, those who would oppose the church, the experience of the church will, will present themselves, we can um, respond in a sensible way, which is not over-aggressive, uh, and also which doesn't surrender anything of the truth. We can behave, I would suggest, like normal people. We live in a world that promotes us to behave in an abnormal way. We become so abnormal. And part of the process of living an Orthodox Christian life is reacquiring normality, <laughs> the way in which God made us. We have to become normal again. And so this is a great opportunity uh, to do that. Um, so these are more political and social strategies, and they're fine up to a point. But there are more essential strategies, uh, which are those which enable us to be true Orthodox Christians and help our soul and the souls of others. And I will give you these four points. So one is rediscovering real education. If we want Orthodox people, adults, teens, and uh, children uh, to become uh, mature in their faith and to be able to live real Christian lives where they're not just blown around in the wind by every uh, wind of doctrine, as the scripture says. Um, we actually have to uh, give people a chance to learn about how the saints lived, what they taught us that applies to our everyday life, and how we can face the struggles uh, of our lives, and starting with the struggles of our own passions, right? Because we should be able, we should get to a point, as Orthodox Christians, where we know our sins and passions so well that when someone uh, who's living a same-sex lifestyle uh, wants to confront us, we can talk about struggles that we've had, maybe not every struggle that we've had or every personal issue, but some struggles that we've had that are just part and parcel of the Christian life. And we can just present that to them and say, you know, as Orthodox Christians, this is what life is about. That's what the cross is about. To when the Lord says, take up your cross and follow me, he's talking about whatever passions you have, that's what you struggle with, and that's how you are enabled to uh, follow Christ and become like Christ. Most of us aren't going to get to the destination where we're perfect and, and passion-free, but the, in the process of doing that, we're actually carrying our cross. So when we talk with someone, not, not talking about the activists who are very angry, who are very eager to you know, destroy us. I'm talking about average people who struggle with different passions, and not just sexual ones, but all sorts of other things as well. If we can talk about them honestly, because we know ourselves and we know our own passions, and we're confessing them, and we're going to communion so that we have them healed, and we're, still, we're praying every day so that God will help us with those passions, then we have actually something to offer the world that is different than the world offers. The, no one else in the world is offering this. A friend of mine, a monk in the States, was on um, Sinai, at St. Catherine's Monastery for seven years, and uh, I said, did you get many pilgrims? And he said, some, but most of the people who visited us were the Bedouin, who are nomads, who are all Muslims. And I said, why did they visit? You know, just, hey, walking by in the desert. I mean, I don't know what the desert is like there, but they're just in the neighborhood, which is, you know, within 50 miles, I guess. It's a lot of empty space. Uh, and he said, no, no, they come by when they have problems. They come by when a sheep of theirs is dying, and they want us to pray for the sheep. They want us to bless the sheep. They come by when their child is very sick, and they want the priest to pray for the child. Not commemorating that divine liturgy, because he's a Muslim, uh, but to pray for the child who is sick, so this poor mother will, 
you know, walk 30 miles so the priest can pray for this child. I said, uh, 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 why do they come to you? They're Muslims. He said, because they don't get it from their own faith. There are no miracles. There are no healings. So where would they come? They would come where there are miracles and healings. Right? And so the Orthodox faith has that to offer. That's a good thing. You can't buy that in any other store, as it were. You can only get this in the Orthodox faith. And Roman Catholics are starting to see this. And Protestants are starting to see this. And this is why we're going to have uh, an influx of these people uh, who, who we're going to have to teach about the faith very carefully. Adults, teenagers, and children. And we're going to have to say, what are the issues that are most relevant to their lives that the church speaks about? The best way to teach in the faith is to know what someone's already wondering about and answer that question. Our tendency when we catechize, and we have to do this to a certain extent in catechism before baptism, our tendency is to say, what does this person need to know as far as I'm concerned, and I'm going to give it to them. But often we leave their big questions unanswered. We need more opportunities in the church for people to get their heartfelt questions answered. Because then the faith is going to really mean something to their everyday life, moment to moment. Uh, sec uh, secondly, uh, oh, so I guess I went into the second, the second point there. It was a return to personal uh, integrity. Elder Paisius says that, was asked, um, who are the righteous? He said, we hear about the saints and the righteous in the scriptures, make reference to the saints and the righteous, the saints and the righteous. We knew who the saints are. Who are these righteous? We don't have a bunch of people up on the walls of the church with no halo, with righteous so-and-so. They're not quite saints, but they're not us. Like, we don't, who are they? Who is it referring to? And look, Elder Paisius said, oh, the righteous are those um, who are struggling uh, to live holy lives. And usually failing. <laughs> those who are trying. Those who are simply trying. The righteous are us. We are the righteous. Now, we're not righteous because we're perfect, or because we're holy, or good. We're righteous because we say, I need to try, and I'm going to try. One of the fathers, I think, Dorotheus of Gaza says that uh, there are really only two groups of people in the world. Those who are making the spiritual effort, engaging in the spiritual struggle, and those who aren't. In the church, we have those two groups too. <laughs> and we need to be in the first category those who are making the spiritual struggle. And when an issue like the redefinition of something as foundational as marriage comes up, uh, it should refocus us on this. It should refocus us on what is the essential battle, and the battle starts with struggling in our own lives against our own sins. Uh, thirdly, uh, we, learned, we need to learn to treat people as if, they were act they, as if we were actually Christians. Now, that might sound obvious, but of course I treat people like they're Christians. Or like we're Christians. I behave like a Christian. Uh, but we have to learn to get along with those who even want to kill us. That's what it means to love our enemies. That's a hard thing to do because often today our enemies are very in your face and really very easily rattle us with their level of anger and intensity, the effects of some things they do, the kind of things they might want to teach uh, in the schools as a result of things like uh, your Supreme Court ruling. Certainly they're, they're uh, teaching it in spades in, in Ontario schools now. It just started in September, and I won't go into detail, it's a whole other, whole other talk. Uh, but it can be very tempting for us to just want to throttle these people. But as Christians, that's the very impul the impulse we have to fight. We have to overcome that, and we have to, as St. John Chrysostom and St. Maximus the Confessor say, we have to show them what is real love, and love is desiring that they are saved, desiring that they should be in the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty tough when you have a pink-haired lesbian activist but with her fist under your chin, spraying uh, paint in your face or something. Pretty hard to love. But that's what we're called to do. Those are the enemies we're called to love. That's tricky. And on a day-to-day -day basis, because we're going to be encountering, hopefully, we're going to be encountering people like that every day, on a day-to-day -day basis, it will mean uh, uh, gaining the inner 
inner stillness so that we can uh, love people who just get really mad at, at us at work or at school or even at church. I remember a couple years ago we brought in um, uh, a speaker from the United States who is uh, a psychologist who works in counseling um, people on various things, but especially on sexual issues and his, his area especially is to integrate the teaching of the church fathers uh, in counseling those with unwanted same-sex attraction. What a great ministry. I told him, okay, we need to legalize cloning because we need about 50 of you, right? <laughs> but just scatter you all around the country because there's a real need for this. I was recently sent a list of names uh, to pray for of Orthodox Christians. One priest collected them from various people who knew of Orthodox Christians who have this struggle. And I think there were 200 names on the list. They're just Orthodox Christians, right? So he's, he came to speak on this issue, critical issue, and he spoke, he spoke wonderfully. It was one of the best talks I think we've ever had in terms of practical usage. And uh, I was contacted by a member of another Orthodox community in our city, someone who I knew, a young woman, um, who was very angry that we would dare to bring him in. And she sent me this long rant of an email. She's not a ranty kind of person, but she was very clearly angry, very angry. And uh, I quoted my spiritual father when I sent her a reply, and I said, well, frankly, I don't take, she said, don't take, please don't take any personal offense at this email, I, you know, I don't hate you or anything, but I just think you're completely wrong. And that's why I emailed her back, and I said, uh, well, I don't take any offense, because actually, you, you don't actually have any argument against, with me, you're just arguing against the saints. Take it up with them. And that was the end. This kind of angry opposition is going to come from within the church. Not a lot, not as much as the Roman Catholics are seeing or certain Protestant groups are seeing, but we're going to have some. And we're going to have to learn to love those people. Sometimes we'll have to love them by uh, physically restraining them <laughs> or something, but we're, we, have to, we have to love them. And that's going to be very difficult. It has certainly been difficult in our experience. Oh, by the way, um, Christian love does not mean caving to what somebody else is, say, is saying. I used for a group of students an analogy of um, the flip-flop. You know the summer shoes that teenage girls wear? They're bad. They're bad shoes. They are an accident waiting to happen if you get caught in the deck and they'll trip you up. Somebody else can get their toe caught in them and fall. Um, uh, they fall off very easily. They don't offer any protection when you're walking in the water because they'll slide off and your foot will hit the jellyfish in, in the beach in mm -hmm. Florida and you'll still get stung. It offers no protection. And even if none of those things happen, a flip-flop is bad for your feet. But you know what? I can still like you, be your friend, be your neighbor, and tell you your flip-flops are wrong. <laughs> that they're a sin. <laughs> they're a sin as shoes go. And we should look at these questions, particularly the question of this divide over marriage, in the same way. I can still be your friend and tell you that you are blessedly wrong and you need to change. And if you're an Orthodox Christian, I can go the next step, because if you're outside the church, then, you know, I, I'm, I can't be a policeman. But if you're in the church, I can go the next step and say, you, you need to repent. As a priest, I say to young men who like to spend certain amounts of unseemly time with young women in their beds, young women they're not married to, uh, you can't go for Holy Communion. You need to change that. doesn't mean I hate you. It just means you need to change that. Because it's not the life of holiness to which an Orthodox Christian is called. That's the kind of love we need to develop for people. Our tendency is to have uh, either too much truth and be everybody's judge, jury, and executioner, or too much love and be just like a permissive parent. I don't know if you've seen um, a comedian named Russell Peters. He's a Canadian comedian. He's East Indian, but he's born in Vancouver. And he does a he does a comedy routine where he contrasts his Indian parent, his father, who was very strict, with the parent of his friend named Ryan. And Ryan's, uh, Ryan was an angry kid, and he was always swearing at his mother. 
And so of course, there's a lot of swearing in this comedy routine, which is, you know, you can't show it to, you know, people under 16 or something because it's, it's, it's too much swearing. But he's very, this kid was very aggressive. And his mother, his mother's response would be, Oh, Ryan, stop being so angry, right? We can't be that soft and floppy when it comes to things that really matter, just as a parent wouldn't be that way. What do you want to do to your kids? You want to mess them up? Like Ryan's mother? We still have to, we still have to hold to the truth of our faith. But at the same time, we do so with gentleness and love. Um, and finally, I would say, the last, or the last of these points, uh, is improved spiritual education. Uh, uh, the church has a critical role, as we've said before, in helping people learn ways to maintain their spiritual life. Um, and every parish member and priest and bishop has to really relearn and teach traditional spiritual life uh, so other people can see it. Uh, and if we don't, uh, if we don't, aren't already doing these things, maybe we need to reread something like Unseen Warfare by St. Theophan the Recluse, or we discover what the passions are that we're struggling against, like uh, Metropolitan Herophios in his great books uh, writes. Or maybe we need to relearn what confession is um, from the books, the book by Metropolitan Anthony Karpovitsky, which is a really wonderful outline of how to confess our sins. Weekly church school for children and adults needs to address these issues and not just teach people about the feasts and the icons. It's not enough to survive as Orthodox Christians in our time, just learning about the feasts and the icons. They have to lead into the heavy duty, everyday issues. Some additional uh, listeners, there we are, <laughs> expanding the crowd. Uh, just to conclude, um, I was at an event recently where there were 80 college age students and I had the privilege to speak. And afterwards, nine of the students stayed uh, uh, to ask me privately a number of pastoral questions. Nine out of eight, so a little over 10%. Five of these students' questions were related to the issue of redefining marriage and same-sex attraction. Five out of the nine. I, I did not ask an offer for anyone to come and ask me questions. These students all approached me, wanted to talk about these things. I got home late, probably an hour and a half or two hours later than I expected to get home that night. And I can tell you my wife was not pleased. She was not pleased. She said, she said you'd be home by 8 o'clock. We have things to do with the family. You are not home. Matushka couldn't relate to this. <laughs> you were not home. Why weren't you home? I said, well, there were all these kids that knew to talk about these things. She said, they're not your parish members. They have their own parish. And some of them aren't Orthodox, and they should... They have places they can go. Why did you spend time talking to them? And why don't they go to their parish priest? And I said, because in most cases, they can't. In most cases, their parish and their parish priest is not addressing these issues and not giving them teaching about these issues. And you're blessed to be in a community where you have a priest that cares about talking about these things. Because this is what kids are hearing about on the playground in grade 5. And these are the issues that teenagers and college students are struggling with in their everyday lives at school. The things of the church, the prayers and the proper making of the sign of the cross, the doctrines, the creed, the holy services, the worship, the reading the Athos to the saints for particular needs, all of these things are the tools of our faith that we need to use to achieve the goal. But if we don't have a concrete knowledge of how to actually put those into work to deal with our everyday problems, then they just become a routine. And for many young people, they aren't connecting the dots. I would say many adults are needed. They're not connecting the dots between what we actually do in our prayers, in our reading of the scriptures and the saints, uh, and in uh, worship at church, and how that relates to helping me in my everyday life, with my everyday problems, with my friends who are going through these various issues, uh, who uh, may be desperate, may be addicted, or whatever. <coughs> Our task in the church is to connect those dots so that the teachings of the church, of the fathers, of the Holy Scriptures, the teachings that we see in the Holy Services can be applied in our everyday life in such a way that people can not just see the power of God, but know the power of God. Know that the Orthodox faith has this power to transform people's lives, not in an emotional way, not in a, I love Jesus and I'm saved and going to heaven, hallelujah kind of way, 
but in a way where people have actually seen the effect it has in their own lives, and it changes them from the inside out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, one thing you said was, and I've thought about this a lot, was, um, uh, you know, so you somebody comes up to you and they, they have a same-sex attraction or, or whatever, and um, and then you say that I struggle with passions too. But how many people that are in that situation, especially who aren't Orthodox or some kind of Christian, how would they even recognize it as a passion that they should actually be fighting? Uh, some uh, some will, but most won't. I think you I think you've you've hit on something very important. Most won't. Um, but they will recognize that they have a lot of pain in their life, and that following their passion, not just not just that same sex passion, but any passion really, it ain't it ain't doing it for them. It's not giving them peace and joy. Um, I was talking a number of months ago with a young woman, Orthodox young woman, who lived for many years in same-sex relationships. Um, she, fortunately, she's very candid with me. She's struggled tremendously to leave that behind and has, where God, been successful so far. Um, but I said, I still struggle with the feelings. I still struggle with the feelings. I said, yeah, that's called a passion. I struggle with, with feelings to do lots of things. Like kill people or <laughs> right? There's a passion. There's one that if you follow it, you can't change it, right? It's done, right? So that's a pretty serious passion, right? Uh, she said to me, one thing that helped her in a, in a quirky sort of backwards way, one thing that helped her uh, was uh, seeing the pain in her own life. Nobody had to say to her, that relationship you have is unhealthy. It won't lead you to salvation. Uh, you're not going to have joy and completeness and fullness in that same-sex relationship. She said, you didn't have to say that to me. I felt it every day. I went from one relationship to another, to another, to another. And I could feel it, right? It's, and it's, it's not unlike the young man who has one girlfriend after another, after another, after another, and is sleeping with her by the third day. It's not unlike that. You know, there's another uh, dimension to it. Because there's something that, that takes uh, a natural affection and turns it on its head. But in a way, there's also an element to it where in any relationship, the Shri Fathers talk about this to a certain extent too, what are we seeking? What is a man seeking from a woman? One thing he's seeking is what that which he doesn't have in himself. Right? That's why opposites attract. Anyone who's married would appreciate this, right? You tend not to marry someone who's like you. You will, be not, you will not be surprised to know that my wife is a much better listener than I am. Right? I'm more of a talker, she's more of a listener, because we complement one another. If I had married a talker, one of us would be dead. Right? We, couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't endure that. So God gives us each other to perfect one another by our differences. Of course, in a same-sex relationship, uh, there is this dynamic too, but it can, it can never be uh, brought to fruition because the fundamental differences aren't there, right? There will always be gaps. And so uh, speaking to those gaps, speaking to what's um, missing becomes very important, but only where people are receptive. I would say in one of the mistakes that in Canada we would say, American Protestant Christianity, forgive me, there are these people in Canada too, we call them Canadian Protestant Christian, <laughs> uh, but they do the same thing. The idea that you're going out with your product of Christianity and you're assuming everybody is your market, right? If you're selling shoes, you need to find someone who needs shoes. You don't go to people who have lots of shoes. Maybe you do, because I know some women have lots of shoes. They're the most likely ones to buy the shoes. But you go to, you go to, you go to the place where people are actually looking for that which you have to give. And it's the same with this. When it comes to people who uh, may be receptive to spiritual discussions and teachings on same-sex attraction, uh, those, those who are receptive, we can talk about it. Those who have real questions, we can try to answer those, engage those, find the answers. If, if, uh, if, if they aren't real questions, if they just want to fight, you, know, you can almost tell, they just want to get into it with you, um, 
there's no sense in going anywhere with that. And if they're not receptive to spiritual topics, period, uh, there's no there's no reason to pursue them. Yeah. Uh, nice talk. Um, so I, I um, a couple questions. One is the ideal of um, you, you mentioned about the the lesbian with spray painting um, pink in your face. Um, I I think in my my understanding of it is you know there's pacifism where you you know you don't you just like kind of take take it but I mean we, we only have two cheeks you know so I, you know there there becomes you know there becomes a, a time to to fight yes and so I I mean I'm a little bit more sparky I'm a martial artist so I, um so what my question is is when is it when is it time to to fight like I. In Toronto, they had uh, they had a transsexual on the cross, yes. and people were like throwing like um, uh, defecating like uh, bags of um, it was it was pretty bad, you know, um, defecating yes. on the cross on the stage. I mean, all these things are like okay, well, why why isn't that you know mm -hmm. you know you can't you, we can't turn our eyes to that because that's going to happen to my children yes. and that's going to happen to my children's yes. children. Yes. So it's the so beginning. How, it's the beginning of something bigger. Yes. I would suggest, to you, first of all, um, uh, God has made us with different characters. Some people are much uh, better at taking the blows and enduring it, just as some of the saints were. Um, and, and others are better at taking the offensive. Um, and uh, before we take the offensive, we have to make sure we're living a prayerful life, that we're not just taking the offensive out of wrath. If we get that out of the way, and we're not just doing it out of wrath, then we should take the offensive. Uh, and that offensive could be uh, like uh, this American uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, journalist Ben Shapiro. He was on a show where we were talking about. Uh, um, oh, now the name's going to my mind. Um, Jenner, Jenner, the man, the man of many names, and uh, uh, and they had a man on who was partially uh, plastic surgery into a woman but not completely, uh, I don't know what you call it, he or she. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were going at it, and uh, the, the, other, the other person said, uh, if you don't shut up, I'm going to send you home in an ambulance. That's called a threat <laughs> under, under American law. So this journalist, Ben Shapiro, went to the local police and pressed charges. Guess what? The police are going to follow up on those charges. We should do that. We should do that. Uh, it's interesting you brought up that particular point. Um, the same, um, the same young know, woman who had been living for many years uh, in this lifestyle, uh, she went to that parade, and she was very enthusiastic about marching this parade until she saw that she saw that person that was on this cross and they're throwing things, and she saw that, and it hit her so much. As an Orthodox Christian, but she never went to a parade again, and she said that was a turning point for her. So even though we look at that and we would say that's the most repugnant thing, we've got to stop it. Even if we fail to stop, even if let's say we all got together and we all did everything we could to stop it, and we failed. You mean like physically? Physically stop it, yeah. right? Go after them legally, tear the thing down. I mean they tear signs out of our hands, right? So even if we went after it, did everything we could, legally, got a police in, got legal injunctions, did the whole nine yards, but we failed, okay? Let's say we failed, it's still there. God might just use it. So we shouldn't lose hope, right? Just because we've done everything we could, we think, ah, oh, all is lost, right? Well, the, the cross was the symbol of Roman domination. Right. It was the symbol to be feared. Yeah, but we lost. Uh, Our God lost. <laughs> this is what we will do to you if you, and you know, it's we took it and turned it into the resurrection. Yeah. That's right. I mean, for those of you who are as old as I am or older, will remember uh, a, a collection of countries known as the Soviet Union, where Christianity <laughs> was never going to be free, and where uh, Christians would never be defended, and it was going to be up to us to defend Christians all around the world. And uh, of course now everything's changed. Everything's changed, and the West is often the enemy of that which is good, and Russia is defending.
Christians in Syria against ISIS. Who would have thought? So God can, God, even if we fail, we should try to do as much as we can, but even if we fail, we must never give up hope, because God will use even our failures. Another question? So, you know, how many people are actually gay or whatever? It seems like it's not very many, and yet they, they got this power. So, like, what is the percentage? And then the other question was, in this country, they seem to have got the power to do that once they made the argument that um, you're a bigot if you don't yes. let us get married together. Did the same thing happen in Canada too? When, yes. Once they got that argument, like you're a bigot if you can't, don't yes. let us do this. And I would say it was actually more effective in Canada uh, because Canadians desperately want to be nice. Um, you as Americans don't always want to be nice. You might want to stand your ground a little bit. That's very un-Canadian. Canadians would back right up. So, um, Canadians are much more cowed by that threat. You might, you know, you're accused of being a bigot or whatever. And they, they might grumble about it silently. But as a one young man I know said, uh, if a Canadian gets very angry, really, really angry, he's going to write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, how, I mean, this, this technique, this technique of stirring up anger and rubbing people's wounds raw so that they're, they're so fired up and that those who oppose them um, are afraid to say anything. This is right out of uh, um, Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. Right? Saul Alinsky is, of course, the, the communist organizer in the city of Chicago, inspiration to your president, um, your future Democratic nominee. She wrote her master's thesis on it which was available on the internet until they took it off, except for those of us who downloaded a copy. Um, and where she, praised, where she praises this guy for his technique of basically dividing people, making them angry, as anger is a motivator, uh, and making the other side so afraid to do anything that they're paralyzed. Doesn't this sound familiar? This is exactly what's happening today. So one uh, strength that Orthodox Christians have is as we immerse ourselves in the practice of our faith more, um, perfect love of God casts out fear. So if they call us names, or if they attack us and they put us down, um, the closer we are to Christ, the less we care. <laughs> in fact, we might be able to respond quite sensibly, quite generously, quite gently, but assertively. Uh, and, and that, they're not used to that. They're used to people giving up and quitting. Um, and we can't. Okay. So it's actually a political tactic. It is. It is. And I would say, I, I, always, I always speak uh, quite, um, I try to make a clear distinction between people who experience same-sex attraction. That could be a whole spectrum of people, right? There could be people who live that as a lifestyle. And then there could be also those who don't have it as a lifestyle, but who sort of move in and out of it as a passion. It's just a passion. It's like any other passion, right? Like. Our Thanksgiving is in two days. My passion is going to be, do I have three helpings of turkey? But I shouldn't, because I'm overweight, and I have high blood pressure, and I just, now you might say, well, that's, in there. that's not a big deal, Father. But it, as far as the fathers are concerned, gluttony is a big deal. It's actually the root of a lot of other passions. I still have to struggle against that. And it's no higher or lower than same-sex attraction. It's just different, right? So uh, uh, we have to have the guts to, to uh, uh, address the, uh, our own passions, uh, and then we can address people who suffer uh, from every other passion on an everyday level. The other category, though, is those who are activists, those who have the Dan Savages of this world. Dan Savage is a hell-bent individual, hell-bound, I would say. Hell he is an individual who is so full of wrath, uh, if you've never seen him, I, I encourage you, don't look him up. <laughs> Do not watch a Dan Savage video. He's, he's a gay activist. He is one of the most repugnant, um, hatefully <coughs> aggressive. If, you, if he were a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, if you were on the other side, if you were a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, they'd kick him out because he was too socially unacceptable. Because these, you know, these people that are saying, you know, with their, their God hates bag signs, uh, he, he would be too much for them if he were on their side. He is, he's, a, he's a vitriolic, hateful person. Um, I don't believe for a minute that he represents most people who, who experience same-sex attraction. 
I've got past with people with same sex attraction. They don't behave like that. They don't behave like maniacs and put people down just because they see them and they're wearing a cross pin on their shirt or something. They don't behave like that. They may be uncomfortable or disagreeable or whatever. Uh, so, as far as the church's response to people, um, we have to we have to draw that line between human beings, which in most cases, and <laughs> the activists that we call most. Anything else? Set yeah, yeah, one yeah, um, We talked yesterday, this morning, whatever, about the schools, the, yes. you know, and stuff, the younger children. Yes. Um, and while my kids are grown up, but they talk about their previous friends, you know, in and out of relationships, and they tried this, and they tried yep. that, and then they went back, and now they're more in the schools. I'm concerned the fact that if somebody doesn't have a good relationship, heterosexual, let's say, girlfriend, boyfriend, then they go like, well, I guess I'm not cut out for that, so now go to, you know, the one-sided, and then they've got all these clubs that are encouraging it. But if it's really not them, they're doing it just experimenting, yes, like they yes, do yes. smoking, yes. drinking, whatever, you know, then they're going to develop a self-loathing hatred and, and it's going to create more problems sure. for themselves. I remember a student of mine, she was a senior student, and she was talking about another student, she might have told her it was, I can't remember, uh, but it was someone else in the school, uh, who was a young man who was, uh, she said, hey, this guy's a gentleman, father, he's a gentleman, he's a gentleman. And, uh, he confessed something to me that he didn't want me to tell anybody. And I thought, oh, what's it going to be? I thought I knew what it was going to be. You know what it was? He didn't like watching pornography. A 17-year-old didn't like watching pornography. And he didn't want his friends to know. What? Yeah. Because they would think, he's nuts. Yeah. He's nuts. And then he said to her, I realized I must be gay. Yeah, right. That's and she said, thing. why? She, he said, because I don't, I don't like watching these scenes in the pornographic films. And she said, well, do you like girls? Oh, yeah, I like girls. Do, are you interested in boys? No. Okay. Basically, you're normal. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like watching something twisted. You're normal. But the, the, the story goes... if you don't goes, speak up, he's going to assume yes, that that's... That's right. That's right. And this is why we have to be very careful of how we approach the education of kids. I have come to the, the, the point in my own life, we homeschool our kids and we have since, since uh, our eldest was little. Um, I worked in public, I was a, a public school trustee for nine years. I worked in our provincial legislature for several years. I was a high school teacher in a publicly funded school for six years. Uh, and I've homeschooled for whatever, 10 years, more than 10 years. Um, I've come to the conclusion that if you want to actually give a whole talk on this that was about three hours long, so I'll try to make it a 10 second something. <laughs> uh, if Orthodox Christian families want to be sure they will have even a chance of retaining the, the souls of their children in our society today, they have to homeschool. Wow. I said that to a member of our parish who nearly punched me in the nose. He was so angry. He said, well, you want to hide yourself away from society and blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, I'm a real hermit, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm not talking to people all the time, probably too much, uh, for my own you know, peace of heart. But um, the, the capacity that one has to develop the character, the intellectual ability, and the knowledge of kids, if they're spending 40 hours a week in a public school, or even a private school, um, is really diminished today. Because so much of that curriculum, which used to be solid curriculum, has now been either watered down or filled with ideology. 15, 20 years ago, it was environmentalism. Environmentalism is a very strong ideology in the curriculum. Uh, now, it's this sexual ideology. And there are only so many hours in a day, and you cannot fight 40 hours of instruction with two or three good hours at home every night and an hour in Sunday school. You're going to lose. You're going to lose every time. And so when we see these statistics of 85% of Christian, self-identified practicing Christian college students leaving their faith, and maybe even denying God by the time they graduate from college, we shouldn't be surprised. But yet, I believe most of our churches will say, yes, and the answer is, we will get good Sunday school teachers. No, that just teaches them a little more information about faith. That's important. 
But that's, that's not teaching them how to be Orthodox Christians. They need to learn that from their families. And to learn that from their families, they need time with their families. And that means, of course, that Orthodox Christians are going to have to give things up, like trips to Florida, right? Or two cars, or a house that, in, that they might want to have. They're going to have to make sacrifices. And that's not popular, right? And I, I mean, I'm glad I'm not making my living trying to sell that, or I'd be going hungry. <laughs> um, but I think Orthodox Christians are eventually going to, one by one, family by family, are going to clue into that reality uh, as they see other people's kids uh, in the church, drop. Yeah. Sorry to end on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Yeah. Well, shall we say a, a sing a Scrooge Week? We give you to bless you, Theotokos, ever blessed, the most pure, and the mother of our God, and humble and the cherubim, the own convivial voice, and the seraphim, thou without stain, is born God the Word, and truly Theotokos, we magnify thee. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Amen. Through the prayers of holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen.